Alrighty then. So we've already talked about the laws of thermodynamics. And so today I wanted to talk about the enzymes because in cells, as I mentioned yeah, the last uh, lecture, that's how um, all of those chemical reactions are moderated. They're moderated by enzymes. So we need to spend a long time talking about enzymes because they're so important. So let's start just like we always start with the structure first and then the functions. So structure first of an enzyme. They are all proteins. I don't have purple uh, pen ink here on my iPad, so I'll have to use blue. They're all proteins. And remember, proteins are made of chains of amino acids. And proteins are going to particularly enzymes. We call them globular proteins. A dot A for amino acids. We call them globular proteins because they are shaped. Um, they're not particularly alpha helices at the end. They're not particularly um, any other shape, but kind of like a blob or a glob. So I'm going to draw a protein that's an enzyme over here. And I usually try to include some alpha helix and beta pleated sheet to make it look somewhat familiar from um, what we talked about a couple weeks ago when we talked about the different levels of organization of proteins and how they form their three-dimensional shape. Right here, I would label this first amino acid that I've put on the chain there. That's the uh, amine group there. So I'm gonna put N3H, oh wait, sorry, that's wrong, right? That's supposed to be the N and this should be the H, H3N. And I'm gonna label this one COO because that's the carboxyl group of the very last amino acid. Right. So try to remember it's a long chain of amino acids that's then folded up into secondary, tertiary, quaternary structure sometimes. So this is the enzyme here. Now there are some features of this protein that we have to account for and keep track of. Okay. And in addition to the protein portion, most enzymes have what we refer to as a cofactor. And this is usually an or a coenzyme. And so a cofactor, those are usually metal ions that are attached directly to part of the protein of the enzyme in a particular place. And they're, they're big metal ions like zinc, iron, um, manganese, for example. All right, let's, so I'm going to put manganese on here. And they might be attached right here. And they're an integral part of the protein. And if they're not there, the protein won't fold correctly. And if it doesn't fold correctly, we're going to see the folding or the shape or the conformation of this protein is super important in the function of it. I know that's a plus manganese. I don't know how many. Maybe two? I uh, don't know. Or the protein has an additional helper molecule that we might that we refer to as a coenzyme. And a coenzyme is usually a little bit larger. It's an organic molecule, so not inorganic like the metal ion. It's an organic molecule, and it's usually non-protein, so it's not another protein that's attached. It's a vitamin oftentimes. And those we're gonna see as we get to the end of this chapter, or the beginning of the next chapter rather, those we're gonna see, those vitamins, they are often combinations of nucleic acids, uh, actually of nucleotides. So things like B12 or niacin. Okay. So when you guys take vitamins, and then, you know, when you take vitamin tablets or vitamin gummy, which is my preferred method of taking vitamins, clearly if we ate a perfect diet, we wouldn't need to take the vitamin supplements. But you'll notice if you read down the jar of your vitamins, there's vitamins and minerals. And that's the point. The vitamins and the minerals, they're there. You're taking them as supplements to help your enzymes work their very best. 
to digest your food the most quickly, to build proteins the fastest, whatever those enzymes are doing, all the enzymes are doing it in your body. Inside cells, there are thousands of enzymes. And because they're made of protein, they're all coded for in the DNA of the cell. So in eukaryotic cells, that would be all those chromosomes in the nucleus. Okay, so one more thing about the structure before we go on and start talking about the functions of enzymes. Last thing I need to tell you about the structure is, and I know this doesn't show up great, but I am gonna use the yellow anyway, is this area of the enzyme here that I'm coloring in right now. It looks like a pocket, a groove, a space. It's called the active site. And it's super important in the enzyme because it's the place where um, the enzyme activity happens. And the enzyme activity is a chemical bond making or being broken, being made or both broken, chemical, make or break a chemical bond. I think that's said just like that in that handout for chapter eight. I think that's what it says. The function of enzymes is to make or break a chemical bond. The other important thing that you need to know about that active site is this is where the specificity of the enzyme comes from. This is why we say one enzyme, one substrate. So the molecule that's going to fit into the active site, that's the substrate, and it has to mimic the shape of that enzyme, at least this portion of it, so that it can fit exactly into that site or groove. It doesn't matter so much what's out here, right? As long as this portion fits perfectly. So this little molecule that I've drawn sort of coming into, that's the substrate. And it could be, for our purposes, it's gonna mostly be food molecules. It's gonna be organic molecules, glucose, piece of starch, part of a lipid. In order for that substrate to fit perfectly into the active site, the substrate, and I again, I think I list, listed them as three blanks on your handout. The substrate must be the same shape as I tried to draw there, size as I also tried to indicate there, and this one's equally important, charge. So if I go back to my previous picture, and I think I'll use red here, um, be green because I haven't used green. So if there's, for example, if there's little negative charges here on the amino acids right along this blue area here where that, where the polypeptides, those side groups of the amino acids where they happen to have negative charges, then the substrate has to be complementary to that. The substrate would have to have positive charges there so that they would bind together and fit. It doesn't have to be like negative charges all the way around that active site. It could be areas of positive and negative charge or areas of hydrophobic um, interaction or nonpolar interaction as well. Once the substrate fits into the enzyme, I realize many of you have learned this as a lock and key model. That's kind of old fashioned. We don't usually use that word anymore. That's kind of a, and it's easier for young, younger children to understand lock and key model. We refer to the shape change, which is a change in conformation. That's a chemistry word that indicates the shape of a molecule, the structure of a molecule that gives it its shape. So the change in conformation of an enzyme bound to its substrate it's called the induced fit model.
and um, that um, I think if I go away from my share, I'm going to lose you. Let's see. If I, yeah, I think I think if I go back to the camera, I lose you on this device. But if if I do, I'll just redraw those because the easiest way for me to I want the video to just be me. How do I do that? Post. There we go. I can't even big. Sorry. All right, we'll just have to see it small then. Um, induced fit. So think of it like your fist. If this is the enzyme, your other hand, and that my fist is the substrate, right? When the substrate binds to the enzyme in the active site, so right here where my um, hand is, that's the active site. So when the substrate binds to the active site, the enzyme does this. It actually closes around it. That's what we mean by induced fit. It does slightly change shape in order to fit really tightly around that substrate so that it can do the chemistry. All right, so make those go away. So that's what we mean by induced fit model of enzyme substrate binding. Another just sort of tidbit about enzymes that you should know is that, well, I'll leave this, sorry. I'll go back to this board. Is that most enzymes, not all of them, but most, the, their name ends in ASE. So that's the suffix on the end of their name. And what us identify that a particular word is an enzyme. For example, this enzyme, sucrease, right, ends in ASE. That is an enzyme literally that breaks sucrose, in, which is a disaccharide, into its monosaccharides. Here's another one. And I've particularly chosen one that's a long word that's unfamiliar to most of you, right? This enzyme is called DNA polymerase three, Roman numeral three, right? And you don't have to freak out because the name actually tells you either the substrate or the product. So in this case, it's the product. This enzyme, DNA polymerase three, makes polymers, so builds chains of DNA. Easy peasy. So this is very useful for you to kind of put in the back of your mind because when you get to Chem 2, for example, or if you take organic chemistry because you um, are a biology major, you're gonna need to learn some of the names of enzymes. And if you can remember that their names tell you either their substrate or the product that they make, that'll help you a lot later on. Now, there are a few some of the early enzymes that were discovered and named don't end in ASE, they end in zyme. Okay, so that's enzyme, ends in zyme. And an example of that would be um, lysozyme, which is an enzyme that's found in body fluids. So it found, it's found in tears, saliva, uh, all kinds of mucus, breast milk, and um, it basically degrades the cell walls of bacteria. So it's sort of one of our non-specific defenses against bacteria as an enzyme that we have. All right, let me just, I wanna just double check that I've covered everything about the structure of enzymes that I need to. Globular protein, cofactor coenzyme, ASE, active site, defense of three. Okay, good. All right, so then now let's start talking about the function of enzymes. Okay. So this is, um, you can say the function in a simple sentence, but it's a really complex sentence. Okay, and that is the function of an enzyme, the true definition of a function of the enzyme is to lower the activation energy 
required for a reaction to take place. Now, we define that, that is the definition of in chemistry we call it a catalyst. So a catalyst is a substance that will speed, we say in shorthand, it speeds up a reaction. And how it does that, how it speeds up a reaction is by lowering the activation energy, Xn for reaction. Now, enzymes are not the same as catalysts in chemistry reactions. Enzymes are specifically, and I'll put this in red so that it's real bright, and we know that it's super important that we call them a biological catalyst. And no, that's not just to make this more complicated. We know that that's what it seems like to a lot of students in bio one. They're just like, okay, we already gave it a name, right? We have to give it another name. Because this name is more specific. And in science, we're all about specificity. As little gray area when we are describing something known as possible, okay? The biological prefix, or the putting biological in front of the catalyst, the word catalyst, gives a really important feature to an enzyme. They are reusable. So they are made of proteins. Proteins are expensive for cells to make. So once a cell makes one of these enzymes, it's beneficial if the cell can use it over and over and over again, rather than one time. Those of you that have already had chemistry or remember some chemistry from high school, you know that when you add a catalyst, you have to keep adding it in order for that reaction to keep going, right? It runs out, but not an enzyme. It's completely reusable. So these are really valuable commodities inside a cell. Now, what does it mean to lower the activation energy? There's usually a picture in your book. And it looks, I'm gonna actually start a new whiteboard for this. It's usually a picture that looks kind of like this. There's a graph and there's always like a dashed line here. And this is where the reactants are and they show you in black like this. And over here, they put, um, so the substrates. And then down here, they put the product. So this is supposed to look, this is supposed to be mimicking the course of a reaction. And over here, they write free energy. That means how much potential energy you have to put into this reaction in order for it to occur, to occur. So this could be, this could come in the form of electricity, light, chemicals, right? All those different types of energy we talked about uh, last time. And this is progress, progress of reaction. And then there's always a, another line on this graph and it looks like this. It's always same curve like that. But, uh, I guess I'll make it in yellow, right? So see how this, the crest of the second curve in red is much lower. And then they write something like over here is without enzyme. And the red is of course with the enzyme, plus enzyme. And this picture, it's always actually about this size in a book. And I find it to be, for, especially for bio one students, not very impressive when you look at it. When you see it and you're just like, okay, this much space, that makes a big deal, right? What I'm gonna tell you next is this sort of long example, but the point of it is to show you that this change here from without the enzyme to with the enzyme, this area here, this is actually millions to billions of times faster, okay? That's how much faster things go with an enzyme compared to without. So I'm gonna describe a chemical reaction that goes on in your body, in your blood. 
CO2 plus water forms carbonic acid, which is H2CO3. And you obviously know what carbon dioxide is and water, clearly. The enzyme that helps this reaction along, the enzyme's name is carbonic anhydrase. Okay, so that's the enzyme that's working right here on this line, forcing this chemical reaction. Would it happen by itself? Yes, black line. With the enzyme, red line. Okay, so now let's take 10 seconds and um, I'm gonna tell you exactly how much faster this works, okay? So I'm gonna try to get myself my clock here on my phone. And what I want you to do is when I say go, I want you to, I guess you can hear my um, timer. When I say go, I want you to count how many times you exhale in 10 seconds, okay? Ready? Set, go. All right, so that was really a little more like 12 seconds because it took me a couple of seconds to um, do that to my phone. So in 10 seconds, how many um, breaths? Somebody type in the chat. How many breaths did you exhale? How many times did you exhale in the chat? In those 10 seconds. Three, four, five, two, two. Three times. Oh, three. <laughs> three times, two times. Sharice, you must be very fit. Um, four times, <laughs> two times, right. So somewhere between two and four times, right? So I'm gonna put two to four times you exhaled, right? Okay, now here's the thing. Without carbon dioxide, without carbonic anhydrase, you could exhale one, oh no, single, one, molecule, not one breath, one molecule of CO2 in 10 seconds. That's without up here, right? That's this line without one CO2 molecule in 10 seconds. With carbonic anhydrase, and you have lots of it and it's in your bloodstream, it can transport millions of carbon dioxide molecules to your lungs so that in 10 seconds you can exhale lots and lots, billions, to, millions to billions of CO2 molecules in 10 seconds, okay? It's not gonna be on the test. It's not what's important. The details are important. What's important is for you to understand that one molecule of CO2 in 10 seconds, you could barely be a cell. It would just have to pass out of your membrane by passive transport. Two to four times exhaling in 10 seconds, millions and millions and probably billions of carbon dioxide molecules because you have this enzyme in your blood, carbonic anhydrase. That's how important the enzymes are. That's how much faster. And I know this isn't very impressive in the picture here, the with to without, but that's what that means, literally. Millions to billions of times faster. Okay. So that's like the, the big ta-da about enzymes and their function. Now let's go to talking a little bit about conditions that can affect enzyme activity. So your book calls them local conditions. Um, sometimes we even call them environmental conditions because when usually when we study cells, we're studying them outside the body. Right. that affect enzyme activity. Affect enzyme activity. I'm gonna put a list first so I don't forget any of them, okay? And then we'll go through them one by one. So
so um, temperature, pH, pH, sorry, I did that wrong, um, substrate, and I'm going to put that in the squares for substrate concentration, um, and put cofactors, coenzymes there as well, and then inhibitors. And these come in two forms, competitive inhibitors, and the other time kind we call non-competitive inhibitors. Okay, now I'm just gonna go through these one at a time, okay, and finish up with non-competitive inhibitors. I believe on the handout, on the lecture note handout, you'll see it written pretty much like that. I think the only thing that's different here is about the cofactors and coenzymes, and I think I had substrate concentration as the first um, effect. So I'm just going to get a clean board that then I can refer back to the other one. So again, local conditions that might affect enzyme activity. And I think the first one I put on my list there was temperature. Pretty simple, okay? If you increase the heat, if you increase the temperature, you are going to increase enzyme activity. So make it faster, make the reaction occur faster and get more product. That's what I mean by enzyme activity. With limits. And the limit is um, the limit of the temperature of the enzyme the protein can stand before it denatures or before it loses its conformation. In humans or human cells, that limit those enzymes work best, we say between about 32 degrees Celsius and 42 degrees Celsius. Actually, I usually say um, 35, so I'll put 35 there. Right, because your body temperature is 37. That's where we have optimum activity. If you increase that heat much over 42 degrees Celsius, um, usually we say about 60 degrees C, the enzyme, there's a specific word for the conformation change that happens, the enzyme denatures. And that means bonds are broken, um, between the amino acids of the enzyme, right, because remember it's made out of protein, and it loses its uh, conformational shape. So basically what happens is you lose the active site. And if there's no active site, then there can be no place for the substrate to bind. And if there's no place for the substrate to bind, then there can't be any making or breaking of chemical bonds. So the enzyme is denatured. Increased heat temperature, excuse me, when it denatures an enzyme, that's not reversible. You've cooked food, right? So we usually use the example of cooking an egg. It's a liquid, you put it in the pan, it gets hot, it turns into a solid. You can never make that egg go back to being the same liquid that it was. Cold temperatures, ooh, let's use blue for cold. Cold temperatures, no, they do not denature. They will slow an enzyme down. But they usually, um, if you can actually freeze it, um, it will cause the enzyme to stop working, but most of the time it does not denature. Most of the time when the molecule is thawed, especially if it's thawed in the absence of water, if it's been lyophilized or freeze dried, then the enzymes work just as well. Okay, so temperature can influence enzyme activity. A little bit of heat can make enzymes go faster. 
Too much heat can denature them. Cold will certainly slow them down. pH, it's our second condition, local condition that can affect enzyme activity. Acids, remember acids are proton or hydrogen ion donors to the solution. Back to chapter two. So acids also denature enzymes. Why? Because they interfere with hydrogen bonds. That the protein is using to hold its tertiary or quaternary or even secondary structure. Okay, so again, denature the enzyme, changes the shape of the active site, there's no place for the substrate to bind. Bases can um, also affect enzyme activity. So, bases, remember, those are uh, proton acceptors, right, or they have. Um, excess hydroxide ion in the solution. They can also denature an enzyme, but um, usually not, it's not quite as dramatic as an acid. Okay. But also denature. Think about, sometimes spell that. Think about um, the things that we talked about on the pH scale like um, acids, like lemon juice and tomatoes and vinegar, those are all preservatives. And they're preservatives because they inhibit or destroy the enzymes inside bacteria and fungus so that it helps us preserve our food for a little bit longer. You can think about the cold temperature as well, right? Putting food in a refrigerator or a freezer also extends the life of the food because we're killing or inhibiting the bacteria and fungus, their enzymes that would be living on our food. All right, pH, temperature, back to my list here. Number three, amount of substrate. That's pretty, um, or cofactor or coenzyme. Those can also be limiting factors. Right? If there isn't enough coenzyme, you're not going to get optimum enzyme activity. Same with cofactor. If there's no substrate for the enzyme to bind to, right? I'm going to put low, I'll just put low amounts equals directly proportional low products. All right, um, right, so if I never eat any sucrose or any starch, let's say, and then the enzyme in my mouth called amylase that breaks down starch, starts the starch digestion, it's never gonna have anything to do, right? It's still gonna be there, it's just not gonna be producing little bits of glucose for my body to digest if I never eat any starch. All right, and then the last effect are inhibitors. And we talk about these for two reasons. They're pretty self-explanatory. Inhibitor means prevent or stop. Those competitive inhibitors um, they are the driving force behind um, many pharmaceuticals, right? To help us treat our various conditions. When we know the molecule that's supposed to bind to the enzyme, if we can construct a competitive inhibitor that will prevent that particular molecule from binding to the enzyme, then we can, in essence, intervene in a disease or a condition. Okay, so competitive inhibitor is just like it sounds like it would be. Competitive inhibitor has the same shape, size, and charge as the substrate because that's who it competes with. It competes with the substrate for the active site. Competes with substrate 
for the active site. Just like it sounds. Um, and if there's a high concentration of the inhibitor, it can outcompete the, sub, the naturally occurring substrate. As you might imagine, these can be reversible. Right? I took a medication for five days, it had its effect. Now I stop taking the medication and my body goes back to working normally. Or they can be irreversible. Right? It binds and then that's it. That enzyme never works again. An example of an irreversible competitive inhibitor is um, some of the sulfa drugs that we use as antibiotics to kill bacteria. And come to microbiology and I'll explain more about how that inhibitor works, but I'm just giving you this example. Again, not because it's, I'm gonna ask it on the test, but to give you some, a uh, little bit something more concrete than just all this abstract sort of nonsense that I've been talking about. All right, competitive inhibitors. Now, Non-competitive inhibitors are usually a little bit harder for students to wrap their heads around. They have another name, of course, because we can't just call things by one name. They're also called allosteric inhibitors. And that only helps you if you know a little bit about chemistry and or Latin. Right? So they're called allosteric inhibitors because they are molecules. Yeah. Molecules that bind what I mean by that is allo not, underline that in red, not, they do not bind to the active site. And so how this works is, I'll just kind of draw this here. So I'm gonna draw something similar to my enzyme that I had drawn before. I'll try to make the active site a little more obvious. So there we go. So they bind someplace else, like over here. This is the allosteric inhibitor for non-competitive inhibitor. Binds to the enzyme. And once it binds, it changes the shape of the active site. So here's my enzyme that you can see would have fit something that was relatively a square, right? And I guess I should have drawn that. That's the, what happens is when the allosteric inhibitor is bound, it changes the shape of the active site. I'm just gonna make it like that. And now the substrate will no longer fit into the active site. Substrate. Right now, I would need my substrate to look like this, which it does not. Right, that's not the same. These, as you can imagine, can be also reversible. So we would say a reversible non-competitive or allosteric inhibitor, All right? So they can be reversible or irreversible. Clearly, if they're irreversible, that enzyme will no longer function. Example of this would be um, ever. Example of this would be um, the neurotoxins, for example, that can be used to stop 
uh, electrical transmissions in your brain, then you die, right? End of story. There's no reversibility to that. Once those, on, once those inhibitors bind, the enzymes are permanently damaged. Now, a reversible non-competitive inhibitor, actually, lead poisoning is a good example of that. That's why everyone was so upset about, um, so the chemical symbol for lead is PB, right? That's why everyone was so, all the scientists were so upset about um, what was going on in Flint, Michigan, is because it is reversible. If you know that a person is being overexposed to lead, there is a compound that you can administer that will literally um, chelate or bind to all these uh, lead molecules that have inhibited the enzymes and you can clear it from your system if it is gotten to in time, which is why it's so important to have your children tested for lead levels, even if you think there's no reason to do it, right? So lead would be an example of a reversible non-competitive inhibitor. Now, on a more important biological note, almost, let's, I'm going to say all the um, metabolism pathways in cells are actually regulated by reversible non-competitive inhibitors. Last thing, I know it's getting long. This is the last panel that I'm going to um, put up here. Reversible non competitive Sorry, especially when I'm trying to talk at the same time. Reversible non-competitive inhibitors regulate uh, metabolism pathways in a special way. We have a name for that, of course. It's referred to as a feedback loop. Um, although that's a little more general, that usually implies um, hormones um, or more specifically, you'll see it called end product inhibition, which I think makes a little more sense. It's a little clearer. It's probably the term that your book's going to use. Let's see. Active calorie cycle. I think they show a picture of that in your book, and it's also an animation. Yeah. Here we go. Feed, your book's using feedback inhibition. Sorry. Feedback inhibition. But you'll also see it called end product inhibition. And um, I'm going to try to redraw what's in your book. It's figure 821. So I'm going to make my enzyme simpler now. And it's active site simpler. So here's my enzyme, right? And let's say that it binds molecule A here, which is, um, your book gives an example of um, the initial substrate straight is one of the amino acids called threonine, T-H-E-O, T-H-R-E-O, threonine. Okay, that's the substrate. And when the threonine binds there, there's a pathway doo, 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 with other enzymes. Those are supposed to be the enzymes binding and the other molecules to get us to the end product. And that end product is isoleucine. And I'm just gonna draw it as a triangle. Isoleucine is another amino acid. So your cells take this amino acid, threonine, and through one, two, three, four steps, turn it into a different amino acid. Great. So the pathway's going along. Da, 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 da. It's making lots and lots of isoleucine. And then the cell says, okay, we don't need any more isoleucine. We're, we have enough. These isoleucine molecules, here I'll put a red 
circle around them or a triangle, they can go back and there's a binding site for them on this enzyme. That's why it's called feedback inhibition because the end product feeds back and can shut off the pathway. It can become, it is a non-competitive reversible inhibitor because when we run out of isoleucine, this one will get removed and the pathway will get turned back on. Blow it in the middle because that's what I did before. This is how, mo and it makes sense, if you think about it for a few minutes, this makes sense. Your body and your cells, this is how they regulate how much products they make of all these various 20 amino acids or whatever the product is. When we, the cells make it until they have an overabundance of it. And then there's no point because this usually requires ATP. There's no point to keep doing it. When we got enough of it, it can go back and shut the pathway off and it turns off all these enzymes in the pathway until we need them again. And then it can turn them back on. Okay, that's the end of this chapter.